10 creepy cases that were eventually closed. Unsolved Mysteries presented plenty of curious, weird, and scary cases to its viewers. However, some of them actually were solved. Not every case highlighted over the years on Unsolved Mysteries remains unanswered. In fact, quite a few of the cases discussed in the series during Unsolved Mysteries' original run between 1987 and 1989 were solved, thanks to the case airing on national television. Robert Stack is the most famous host of Unsolved Mysteries, which aired on NBC, CBS, and then Lifetime before ending in 2002. Spike TV revived it in 2008 for two years, and Netflix Reboot debuted it in 2022. Unsolved Mysteries delves into much more than missing persons. Unsolved Mysteries delves into much more than missing persons. It tackles murders, robberies, and even unexplained supernatural phenomena. While some stories remain shrouded in mystery, others were eventually resolved. So here are 10 creepiest, mysterious cases. 10. The Face on Mars NASA launched its Viking 1 craft on August 20, 1975. Viking 1's goal, to find out if there's life on Mars. The craft's pods took thousands of compelling Mars photos, including depleted rivers, old volcanoes, and ice caps. The mission also uncovered a strange formation in a desert a formation that bears a striking resemblance to a face. Some scientists speculated in a 1989 episode the face was an accident of nature, while others claimed something more was at play. Something otherworldly. When a new spacecraft visited Mars in the 90s, updated technologies revealed the face on Mars is just a hill that looks like a face at certain angles. Unsolved Mysteries retired the file on this case in 1996. 9. The Mystery of Tom Hughes In 1993, Unsolved Mysteries reported on a man who died of a heart attack at a Connecticut hospital. Hospital staff discovered all of the identifying information on the man, who called himself Tom Hughes, was fraudulent. When authorities became involved, they realized Hughes had been jumping from hospital to hospital across the country for months, seeking treatment for false ailments, with the eventual goal of suing the facilities for mishandling his fake injuries. After the episode aired, viewers identified the man as the late Thomas White. White apparently suffered from Munchausen syndrome, which causes healthy people to make up stories about illnesses for attention. 8. The Identification of Gabby's Bones An episode from 1993 delves into the creepy story of Newell Sessions. In 1986, Sessions found skeletal remains in an old footlocker gifted to him by his friend Gabby. Gabby claimed to have no knowledge of what was contained in the footlocker, which he told authorities he purchased years before without ever opening. Gabby later died by suicide during the investigation. The bones, upon examination, appear to belong to a white male in his 50s or 60s. A bullet was found lodged in the skull. In 2017, the skeleton was identified as Joseph Mulvaney by his granddaughter. The woman, Shelley, told investigators the man known as Gabby was Mulvaney's brother-in-law. John David Morris. Shelley claims Morris did in fact murder Mulvaney, leading to another case closed in the Unsolved Mysteries universe. 7. The Strange Case of Margie Jalosik The story of Margie Jalosik aired in 2001. A successful violinist at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, Jalosik returned home to Gary, Indiana after the tragic death of her husband-to-be, Nassar. Back home, Jalosik became romantically involved with Randy Mad Yeager, a member of the Outlaws, a felonist motorcycle gang. After months of displaying strange behavior, Jelovacic disappeared with Hagger in September of 1997. Jelovacic's mother suspected foul play, but the couple was found living together in Mexico in 2014. Jelovacic died in a high-speed car chase with authorities. Jaeger was indicted on charges of racketeering and conspiracy. 6. Wartime Friends from Vietnam A Lost Friend Case the story of Jim Pearson aired in 1994. During the war in Vietnam, Mitchell Shigemoto served in the U.S. Army. While many soldiers bullied and abused Shigemoto due to his Japanese heritage, one fellow soldier always stood up for him, Jim Pearson. After Shigemoto was shot during a battle with the Viet Cong, Pearson saved his life. Shigemoto recovered in a hospital before being sent home, never hearing from Pearson again. Thanks to the segment airing, Shigemoto and Pearson were united in Hawaii, where Shigemoto now resides. Shigemoto was able to thank Pearson for saving his life. 5. Pierre April's Forgotten Identity 
A few months before this segment aired in 1992, a man woke up in a ditch in Southern California. He had no memory of who he was, where he was, or where he had been before. The gentleman located a blue duffel bag next to him in the ditch, where he found a Boston Public Library card issued to Pierre April. Suffering from severe amnesia, the man used the items in the duffel bag to try to piece together memories about his past. After the episode aired, a woman called in to confirm the man is indeed Pierre April. April was eventually able to reconnect with his parents in Canada, who told him he had been missing for five months. The events surrounding April's disappearance remain foggy, though. 4. Monica Bonilla found after taken by her father. When Monica Bonilla was five years old, her father, Guillermo Ruiz Bonilla, fled Burbank, California with her. According to Monica's mother, Rosemary, Guillermo's personality turned after the assassination of John Lennon in 1980. Guillermo stated John Legend's spirit was reincarnated in him, and he altered his physical appearance to look just like the rock star. Rosemary turned home from work in 1982 to find her house emptied. Guillermo and Monica were also nowhere to be found. This case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries as an update to an episode related to another missing girl, Nyleen Marshall. One caller believed Nyleen was living in Vancouver, British Columbia. The girl turned out to be Monica, who was living in Canada with her father under assumed names. 3. The Identities of the Atlanta-Spokane Bombers In the months surrounding the 1996 Summer Olympics bombing in Atlanta, similar bombings in Spokane, Washington led local authorities to believe the attacks were connected. In one incident, the local Spokane newspaper suffered a pipe bomb explosion in a stairwell that occurred almost simultaneously to a robbery 20 blocks away at the U.S. Bank. Three months later, a Planned Parenthood in Spokane was bombed while another U.S. bank was robbed. Eventually, three members of an extreme far-right religious sect were charged with the bombings in Spokane. When the episode aired in 1997, some commentators speculated that three men were also involved in the Olympics bombing. However, Eric Rudolph, another far-right extremist, was eventually charged for the explosion in Atlanta. 2. Harper's Ferry Remains Airing in 2001, this segment explores the investigation of human remains found in a trunk outside of an entrance to Harper's Ferry National Historic Park in Virginia. Authorities were able to ascertain the person inside the trunk was an elderly white man who had been strangled. They believe the man was likely killed by his caretaker. Two years after this episode debuted, fingerprint analysis allowed police to identify the man as Jack Watkins. His girlfriend, Janet Siegel, was charged for his death. The two met after Watkins' wife passed away. Siegel used Watkins as an endless source of income, continuing to cash his Social Security and retirement checks long after he disappeared. 1. KROQ Confession well-known KROQ DJ Gene Baxter and Kevin Ryder received a disturbing call into their radio show on June 19, 1990. During their weekly usual comedic confess your crime bit, a man called in and admitted to brutally murdering his long-term girlfriend. The man hung up before authorities could locate him. After the episode aired in 1990, the phone call was revealed to be a hoax. Baxter and Ryder were behind the fake call, which they hoped would boost ratings. They were put on leave without pay for a week, forced to complete community service, and told to reimburse the local sheriff's department the money spent on their investigation of the phone call. So that was all. We hope you liked this video, and if you did, please subscribe to our channel for more videos like this.